This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the Word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead. And that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. Father, we just come before you today in the name of Jesus. Father, we ask that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to understand your word. Father, with every passing day, it seems like the world is getting darker. And we could get caught up in that darkness, but instead you have called us to be light in the earth. And the darker the night, the brighter the light shines. Father, today, as we deal with this subject, Father, help us readjust our paradigms so that we are in line with your kingdom and not of this world. And Father, we thank you and we praise you for it. <coughs> in Jesus' name. We're going on part two of moving out of Babylon and pressing into the kingdom. In our last session, we dealt with the perils of easy believism and how that we have reduced salvation to a 30-second prayer and you come up and you get, it might as well be a Willy Wonka golden ticket. And that when you get up there, heaven's got to recognize it. You can live like you want, this as long as you go to church at least once a week. And you don't have to be bothered with a lot of other things. You don't really have to change a lot unless you were carousing and drinking. And you try to kind of cut that back depending upon the denomination and the group that you're with. And we have really lost sight of so many things in the body of Christ. We have, there's this love affair that the modern church has with the world. You know, the Apostle Peter says a dog will return to its vomit. And a believer that has been pulled out of the miry clay, that returns back to the things of the world, that's exactly what we're doing. And we, ha we need to have a clear picture of exactly what the Word of God says in the times that we're living in. And if you have your Bibles, I want to go to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> this is out of the New American Standard Bible. You know, I've noticed with the internet, no matter what you do, you're wrong. That if I preach out of the King James... I have all these people saying, why can't you use a, uh, a translation that we can understand? And then if I ever quote another translation, I have people saying, how dare you, Moses, use the King James Bible? Why can't you? I mean, we, ha we have video evidence of it. We know we see where Moses shows up and God says, thou shalt not. And, uh, you know, a lot of some of the newer translations I'm not big on. Uh, the ones that are the most transliteral to the original Greek and Hebrew are the ones that I prefer. And NASB is a very accurate transliteration. Some of the ones like the ESV uh, are able to uh, take advantage of some of the new things that we have discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so there are times that I'm going to quote them. Uh, I, will, I will never use the nearly inerrant version, the NIV, uh, because it's nearly inerrant and uh, you know, when, uh, you know when, that may work with hand grenades, but not with the kingdom of God, okay? <laughs> Starting in verse 1. 
And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. Underline that in your Bible, the course of this world. And you could almost see it like, have you ever been in a, in, a, in a stream or a river and there's currents, there are courses that move through? Uh, they've even found that there are rivers or currents that flow in the ocean. And there is a current of this world that is guiding everybody that is not saved. Everybody, and it's a dark current. It is filled with every filthy thing imaginable. And he goes on to say, now this current of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, so Lucifer is ruling over it. He says, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. So those that are moving in that current are absolutely disobedient to God. That's natural to them. That's their paradigm. That's the way that they think. They move. They operate. They hate this word. They hate the name of Jesus. They hate being told, you should not sin. And I don't care if they're from Hollywood or they're a politician, or they're a professor, if they're moving in that current, they move in the current of this world, and they are disobedient to their very core. Okay? He goes on to say, Among them we also formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we're by nature. So what, what is your nature? You're the children of wrath. You're the children of the devil that have been earmarked for the wrath of God. Aren't you glad that Jesus delivered us from that? That's why the Bible stresses that we have been delivered from wrath because the wrath can happen both in the book of Revelation and it can happen the moment that you begin closing your eyes in death and you find out you're living in a devil's hell. That is the wrath of God. All of it. Now, I heard one prophet years ago, he said, you know, he said when prophets quit trying to prophesy truth, that sometimes Hollywood will pick up on it and do it in its place. It's like, you know, uh, you know Balaam can prophesy and be right sometimes. And uh, I kind of find it humorous, uh, the, the old zombie movies. I remember the old, old ones, you know, the Night of the Living Dead before they came up with The Walking Dead. And what I loved about those zombies is that they were slow. Yes, they wanted to eat your brains, but it's like, how slow can you go? Because there is a chance for this fat man to get away. <laughs> then they come out with World War Z. That one shook me up just a little bit. Them boogers are fast. You know, it's like, oh, my, my track shoes are not going to work, man. I need a jetpack or something. But what's funny is to the world, we're the zombies. In fact, they have been referring to us as religious zombies. But the truth is, they are the dead men walking. And yes, they want to destroy Christians' brains. Because we think differently. With zombies, if you're not one of them, they want to destroy you. And we have a world, according to the Apostle Paul, we live in a system filled with dead men walking. Mystery, religion is filled with the iniquity force. Its citizens are spiritually dead, walking in the streams of filth of this world, filled with disobedience, consumed with the most perverse carnal desires, and are destined for the wrath of God. That's your neighbor. That's your politician. That's your professor in university. That's the technocrats that are trying to destroy planet Earth. That are herding us into Marxism because on the other side is Luciferianism. They no longer care. You know, one of the things I'm, I'm finding out is this, how many of them are lining up with the CCP? Well, for them, it's economics. Because there's 350 million of us, and there's 1.4 billion of them. They want all them wearing Nikes on America. 
but they have embraced the dark side. If you really knew how the world operated, and it doesn't operate in Washington, D.C. It doesn't operate in the parliaments that are going on, that there are chambers that certain elect people meet with the principalities and powers and rulers of darkness that the Apostle Paul warned about, and that we are in the midst of principality wars. And they give marching orders, and if politicians don't obey those orders, they have accidents. They have scandal. Of course, they always have scandal, but the scandal is always covered up because if you're part of perverseness, guess what? It's because you're perverse, okay? Newscasters. How many know that we have very rarely have news agencies anymore? They have people from the CIA and other intelligence offices telling them what to share. I was surprised this last weekend that the number one story on Fox News, are you ready for this because it's earth shattering? The rise of hot dogs. The rise of the price of hot dogs. I'm devastated. Look over here so that you don't see what we're really doing. It's all propaganda. Guys, they can't even get the weather right. Now everything is about the jab in the arm. You had COVID, don't care, jab, jab, jab. Everybody got to get a jab. We got something new, scarier, and just make you run after the jab. Something that's experimental. Pushed by one guy named Bill Gates, whose foundation is established for the depopulation of the planet. Yeah, he wants everybody to live. Normal people, Christians, normal people don't think that way. Let's just tear the whole system down, is what the protesters are saying on the streets in America. Let's just burn the whole thing to the ground. And they have convinced even some segments of our community, if you're going to protest, you burn your own stores down so that when you're done protesting, you have no place to eat. One of the stories that caught my eye this week was a full-grown man in a women's spa who identified as a woman, walked unclothed in front of not only grown women, but little girls. And these, and let me tell you something, the Latino community is very conservative. They had a hissy fit. Don't blame them, okay? I'm, I'm old school, is women got this, guys have this. You may think you're a tooth fairy, it doesn't matter, okay? You know, that'd be like me saying, I'm just an underfunded billionaire. <laughs> By a billion, okay? You can call yourself anything you want. I've, I've got a t-shirt coming, everybody's worried about your pronoun. My pro pronoun is either Christian or patriot, Okay? And so there were protests, and that guy just happened to be Antifa, so Antifa showed up and beat the snot out of a bunch of Christians that were there just to share Jesus. You know, we look in history, in times past, you know, if they're all wearing brown shirts, we could identify them with Nazis, right? They're brown. But what we forget is in Italy, they were black shirts under Mussolini, and they were called Antifa. But it's just an ideology, right? It's an ideology from hell. That because of the collective poison, the children of wrath are to the place of going mad. Right now we're picking a fight with China and with Russia. While we try to LGBTQ our military. 
as well as, I mean, we're literally, unless the grace of God happens, we could literally be days away from war with Russia because NATO is just hot after Russia for some reason. When nothing really shows that they're doing anything, everything right now that's going on from the election on traces all the way back to the CCP, as far as I can tell. But any moment World War II could happen, all it would take was the right spark. All it took to start World War I was one guy getting shot that shouldn't have got shot, Ferdinand. One guy. And it was the powder keg that set off World War I. And they're getting ready with our U.S. military and the army to give them all the COVID shot, which is an experimental vaccine. So let's just go ahead and make the whole army sick before we have to go to war. You don't do that. It's like, okay, let's get you your vitamins, get you your protein. Go ahead and bulk up, boys, and get in shape because you may have to go to war. Let me tell you something. The enemy's doing it. it, it it's, it's like everybody has got caught up in darkness and hatred, and from my point of view, guys, absolute stupidity. And have you ever noticed that anyone with a voice that comes against the stupidity is silenced? Even if they were, it's like with the mRNA vaccine. I'm probably going to get pulled off of YouTube for this, but... One of the pioneers that founded that entire thing is warning and has grave concerns about using it as a vaccine. Okay, Nobel laureates, silenced. Some of the top virologists on the planet, silenced. Hell is moving while the church is in love with the world. The church has got to stop its love affair on the world. Let's go to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19. In fact, right now, 1 John would be a real good chapter, to, a real good book to kind of read through. Because I love the, the sequence in which the Word of God was written. You know, how many know that your Bible that you hold in your hand, it isn't in the sequence in which it was written? You know, I, I remember back as a young Baptist minister and preachers say, when John wrote the book of Revelation, it was the last thing ever written, and God closed the prophetic, and God closed this, and God closed that. And I'm thinking, yeah, but he wrote the book of John... And then he wrote Revelation, and then he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. So obviously, the Apostle John didn't know what you just said. But I, I can see this Jewish apostle of love. He writes the gospel so that all might believe. And then he's in prison on the Isle of Patmos. And Jesus shows up and said, listen, you're the one you see, John is the one that Jesus entrusted his mama to at the cross. Okay? You don't distrust your mama to anybody. Okay? Out of all of the apostles, it was John. Because John was the one, when they had their final Passover, leaned on the chest of Jesus and knew the heartbeat of God. And so now this old man that was walking in love that they couldn't kill and they had to exile to the Isle of Patmos, Jesus shows up and says, hey, I want to show you something. I got seven letters for you to write, correct, seven churches, and they were real churches back then, although they do speak to the body of Christ at every age. There's something universal about them. But then he goes on to say, let me show you what's coming. If John's hair wasn't white before the vision, it was after. Okay? It's like, holy moly macaroni. What do we do now, Batman? You know? How do... Because John is very pastoral. He is very shepherd-like in his writings. And you can feel his heart going out. 
How do I get them through that? It's a landmine on top of a shooting range, on top of an artillery range. How do I walk them through that? So he wrote 1 John. The only place in the Bible that Antichrist is even used. Talked about how the spirit of the world, the spirit of error and the spirit of truth. And he gave us clues to a lot of things. Says, Let's listen. If someone says they believe in Jesus and don't do the commandments of God, they're a liar. Now this is the apostle of love. Well, that, wasn't that just a slap in the face to a lot of the body of Christ? You know, Acts chapter 15 unhinged us from the Old Testament. False teacher. The church didn't know that. Because at the, at the end of the first century, the Septuagint, the Jews were calling the Christian Bible. And all it was, was the Old Testament. It would be another 200 and some odd years later before the New Testament would take shape. But oh, don't let history and facts mess with your theology, right? But John says here in 1 John 5, 19, For we know that we are of God... And the whole world lies or is under the sway of the power of the evil one. How much is whole? Whole world? Now, if you're wanting a piece of pie, and I go down over there on the table, and I eat the whole pie, how much do you get? The whole system of planet Earth. In fact, you know, as, as I have been... God has been dealing with me with a lot of this. He says, let me show you. Now we are in the world, but not of the world. And so imagine a stream of absolute filth that is so putrid that it, it, it's almost beyond belief. And that's the stream, that's the current of the earth. That's the current of the world system. Now we're out in the middle of that, but we're salt in the earth. And as we group together as believers, it creates a pool of clean, clear water around us in the midst of this perverse world system. That's one of the reasons that, you know, Christian community is important in all these different things, as well as your personal walk. Your personal walk in holiness with God purifies things around you and begins repelling things. How many of the, since you have really gotten saved and gotten into the Word, many of the things that you used to do in your youth are now repelling to you? They're abhorrent. But what we have, guys, have done is they, they don't like the pure water. They've been jumping out of the pure water and going back and swimming in the filth and developing theologies to allow them to do it. That's why much of the church is in the state that it's in worldwide. Now John also gives us this command in 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 15. And for some reason, you know, we don't, in a sense we don't have to get into the Greek or the Hebrew here. How many know English will do? Do not love the world nor the things of the world. But. No, there's no but there, is there? Do not fall in love with the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Boy, this guy's a straight shooter, isn't he? You see, we forget that Paul said, you know, there were those that had left the faith and people were upset about it. And he said they left so that it would be demonstrated they weren't of us. And from my point of view, I don't care how big your church is, how big your national ministry is. If you have fallen in love with the world and you give excuses to the world instead of calling them to Jesus and calling them to holiness, you were never of us. And those we need to mark because they, they can talk about Jesus all day long. But if it isn't talking about how his shed blood 
set us free from the power of sin so that we would not have to sin anymore and brought us so that we could, we could choose to be instruments of righteousness in the earth. If they're not preaching that, they're preaching another gospel and they're preaching another Jesus. And idolatry is rampant in the body of Christ. Babylon has invaded the body of Christ. You say, Mike, how could this happen in America? Communists infiltrated our seminaries in the 1930s. Protestant seminaries. So, and I believe in textual criticism, but I do not believe in higher textual criticism. And there is a marked difference. Textual criticism, this is a holy document, it was breathed by God, and so I will do analytical work to make sure that I'm properly dividing the Word of God. Higher textual criticism puts this book in the uninspired category and treats it as if it was the works of Shakespeare. That's being taught in our seminaries. I have been taken aback over the last few years, just the number of people I hear from. And I, I hear from Christians all the time saying, you know, I've been in church for 50 years and I've never heard anything like this stuff. But guys, I'm hearing from ministers. Just this last week, I heard from two of them. One of them was a seminary graduate, both of them in their 80s. I never heard anything about the priesthood. I never heard anything about keeping the commandments. I didn't even hardly know what the feasts were. I didn't know this. I didn't know that. And I had one brother. He's gone on to be with the Lord. He's part of RFI. And he started listening. And whenever I'd meet him, he said, Mike, he said, you know, I pastored for 40 years. And he said, he said, I'm learning so much stuff now. He says, I look back and he says, I look at my entire pastorate. And this said, by the grace of God, by the grace of God. Because they have dumbed us down. They have dismissed vital parts of the word of God. And they have given us another gospel. Let's get back to 1 John 2. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God, how long are we around for? Lives forever. Now I wanted to look at this passing away in the original Greek, and it's perigo in the Greek, but I, I not, not only like, because you know, its basic definition means simply to pass away, but I also like to look at the tenses and that it is present, which being in the present verb tense means that the writer is portraying an action that is in the process, that the world is in the process of passing away. It's also passive, which means the grammatical voice that signifies that the subject is being acted upon. So there is something acting upon the world to cause it to pass away. And it's also indic indicative, which the mood of this verse means is in a state of being as described by the author is real. So this is real, it is happening, and something is being done to cause the earth to pass away. That's all in that one word, passing away. The earth is passing away. Now, when I, I looked at one of the Greek lexicons, uh, the patristic le uh, Greek lexicon, it not only means to be led astray, it means to pervert. That there is an agent that is perverting planet earth. Well, if you know your Bible, you know Genesis 3 when Adam committed high treason against God. That's when Lucifer became the God small g of this planet. He's the prince of the power of the air. And everything that he is flows to the world systems. Okay? When you look at the fall of Lucifer, he has five wills. I will ascend, I will, I will, I will. Five I wills. He tried to create a pseudo-grace to facilitate his ascension to be equal with God. But what it did is it corrupted what was in him. And we call it iniquity. And avon in Hebrew 
literally means a violent reaction to the rule and the commandments of God. Okay? I mean... You start talking about Jesus, and you start talking about keeping the commandments by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lucifer will get violent. He has a violent reaction. Let's just keep him in seizures all the time. That's just a side note. I'll tell you what, the devil's been hell on me. We'll start giving him seizures then. Start talking about Jesus, the power of the blood, the power of the redemption, who we are, how the Holy Spirit is here. On the first, on the first uh, day of Pentecost, the very first one at Mount Sinai, God gave the commandments. The fire was on the mountain and God wrote the commandments with his very finger into the stone. On the Pentecost, after Jesus came, that fire and the Holy Spirit that gave it moved into us so that we could do it. If that doesn't give the devil seizures, I don't know what does. Okay? But in the fall, in Ezekiel chapter 28, the prophet reveals, he said, By the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade, in your profaned your sanctuaries, therefore I have set, I have brought fire from the midst of you, and it has consumed you. And that's present. It's, it's consuming. It's consuming. It's consuming and so this kingdom of darkness that he is setting up, it's perverted, it's twisted, and it's consuming itself. That's why no nation ever lasts. Guys, all around the world, our civilizations are built upon the dirt of previous generations, previous civilizations. I've got maps in my office that are completely out of date because the nations that were there aren't there anymore and they're called something else. Anybody hear, ever hear of archaeology? So they're digging down many times up to 100 feet or more, unearthing ancient civilizations that declared themselves, we are the pinnacle of civilization on planet earth and now they're nothing but dust and America could go that way every nation on the planet could go that way but we're part of a kingdom without end because our kingdom is not of this world and yet for some reason the church is in love with the world. Let's go to John chapter 17, verses 13 through 17. Now the kingdom is not of this world, but there comes a strategic point where heaven acts, heaven moves. Where Babylon, the great whore, is fallen by the wrath of God. Okay? Not by a couple of preachers, but by the wrath of God. And what is amazing, God just sends one angel. One angel. Done. And it declares something. It, it says, the nations of this earth has become the nations of our Christ. He gets it all back. I'm looking forward to something called the millennial reign. We're going to show these boys how it is done. And it is done with Jesus ruling and reigning in Jerusalem. And I don't know how the pre-tribbers are saying that's going to be a separate Jewish administration because there's going to be a lot of Gentiles serving this Jewish king. Okay? It will be a worldwide administration for a thousand years. I do believe in the millennial reign. I am so looking forward to it. And yes, I do want a pet, big old something. That you, 
that, that normally you can't have. I don't care if it's a, a tiger or whatever. I want a big old pet something. I can go out there and, and pet and wrestle with, and I don't have to worry about it wanting to eat me or anything else because kingdom order has been established. It'll be like it was in the Garden of Eden. And to deny that, guys, and there are ministries that are denying that, there are more scriptures and prophecies in the Old Testament about the millennial reign than there were in the first coming of Messiah. And he's going to rod with a, he's going to rule with a rod of iron. I mean, no, Jesus is not going to take any funny business. And any nation that does not go up and honor him during the Feast of Tabernacles won't have rain that next year. Man, I'm looking forward to it. I'm even I'm looking forward to the new heaven and new earth. We might be dispatched across the universe to do his will. We don't know. It's going to be a whole new universe. Untouched. The devil never existed in. That sin never existed. There had then that universe and that heaven will have never known sin, will have never known a fallen angel. A brand new existence that the Almighty creates to put us in that is absolute perfection and we'll never lose that perfection and we dwell in that perfection with Him forever. Hot dog. That's why we are of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. We are a kingdom, a part of a kingdom that never ends. My destiny is to worship before my king and to serve my king forever, not to be the devil's barbecue, because I've been delivered. Now, John 17 is Jesus' high priestly prayer, and he was not only praying for his disciples, he's praying for all of us, because then it says, all those that believe in my name. Verse 13, but now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may know my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So just as Jesus is not of the world, we're not of the world. So why are we so infatuated with the world? I don't care what the stock market does. I serve a God that owns the cattle on a thousand hills and like one farmer said, all the taters on the hills underneath. God can bless and take care of us. Now, I don't, I don't serve Molech, which is the, another version of the prosperity Jesus. I mean, no, the gospel is not God has called you to be a millionaire. There may, God may have called some to be that to where they could give it all away. To feed hungry kids, how many know you got to have it before you can use it? But this whole, I think that's the influence of Freemasonry, a lot of things. In fact, I have found uh, some of those that teach on prosperity in the past giving these revelations of Jesus, and it was right out of morals and dogma. And so it, there's Masonic stuff that is, so there's, there is a Molech wearing a face of Jesus. There's the Jesus that says, you can now do what you want because I paid the price. Easy believism, Jesus. I changed sin, so it's no longer sin. That's what they're preaching. And calling it grace. Grace is, I have been set free from the power of sin so that I can walk in righteousness. I walk to a different drumbeat. I walk with marching orders from my king, and his name is Jesus. And if anything does not bow its knee to him, I'm not a part of, because I'm a part of another kingdom. These are things we got to rediscover because they have been taken away from our theologies and, and what is regurgitated on many Christian television shows. Now, there have been a few faithful out there But so much of it is mystery Babylon and Marxism wrapped up in a Christian veneer. 
Now listen to this. He says, I do not ask you to take them out of the world. Wouldn't it be this handy? You get saved and poof, you're gone. That'd be kind of hard to build a church. Every time I get them saved, I'll lose a congregation, you know. He says, I'm not asking that you would take them out of the world, but that you would deliver them from the evil one. In other words, help them live in the world without being a part of the world and under the authority of the world. That was, and how many believe that Jesus' prayers get answered? Okay. He said again, now he stresses this, he's, he's using, even in his prayers, he's using Hebraic thought through repetition, which means this is very serious. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth, your word is truth. No wonder they're trying to pervert the way that we interpret the word of God. Still, you know, anybody ever heard of Babylon B? I try to show Mary some of those things, and she just kind of rolls her eyes at me, you know. The one this week was uh, recent archaeological discovery has found out Goliath didn't die of the rock that David slung at him. He died of COVID-19, but that's a, whole, <laughs> that's a whole nother story. But one of my favorite is Joel Olstein is preaching down at his church, and John MacArthur is hiding up in the rafters. And he kind of body slams him like on WWE wrestling. He said he couldn't take him slaughtering scripture one more day. And so he body slammed him and began preaching salvation. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I have, there have been a few times that I have felt like that with some of the things. And Mary will tell you, you know, prophets are giving these words or people are teaching and I'm just shaking my head. No, that does not line up with the word. That does not line up with the character of God. It doesn't line up. I don't care how spectacular that revelation sounds. If it doesn't line up with the word, and you especially don't correct Jesus. He's the one who corrects us. I should have got a real big I mean right there. You see, we're not of this world. Corinthians 1, 13 and 14, for he rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have the redemption of sin. I'm not of this world. And our job is to not go swimming in the miry clay. Our job is to live a life that is so different and so clean and so righteous that hands begin to raise up out of the miry clay wanting out of it so that we can give them a helping hand out. That's why we're left here. God could immediately rapture every single one of us as we're saved, but then there would be nobody to preach the gospel, would there? There would be nobody. You see, true spiritual warfare is not getting your stuff back from the devil. It is fighting for the souls of men. You know, sometimes you can't get your stuff back, but we have put the emphasis of that. We got songs about it. I went down to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. Well, if it was the world's junk, he can keep it. Because what God blesses with, he adds no sorrow to it. You start getting enough of that junk, the sorrow will start flowing in with it. You know, the Bible says we're the salt of the earth. I think we have forgotten that. But I want to go to, and this is going to be just a little lengthy reading, but 2 Peter chapter 2. I think Peter, if he, would, if he wrote 2 Peter today, he would even use stronger words than these. And let me tell you something. This 2 Peter chapter 2 will take paint off a wall. Just listen to this. But false prophets also arose among the people. Just will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction to themselves. Many will follow their sensuality and, be, and 
uh, because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. Isn't that happening today? Okay. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, and committed them to the pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ash, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter, and if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Now, I want to stop right there. Boy, isn't it a shame he didn't hear, but the apostle Peter hadn't heard about grace. Didn't he know the realities of what the gospel did? Maybe he didn't have the Pauline revelation. What a lot many times is being postulated as the Pauline revelation is nothing more than antinomianism and Marcionism. Marcion postulated it in the second century, and Polycarp, which was the direct disciple of the apostle John, they gave him back his gift, threw him out of church, and Polycarp called him the firstborn son of Satan. And yet we have entire theologies today that are based on Marcionism. And it's basically, we're unhinged from the Old Testament. And we don't need the commandments of God. That's Marcionism. So we have been overrun with Martians. Okay? Let's go on. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under the punishment of the day of judgment, especially those who indulge in the flesh and its corrupt desires and despise authority. Anybody see people despising authority? I'm even seeing people in authority despising authority. Crazy. And then, now he's describing them. They're daring self-willed, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties, whereas the angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a, a, a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. Now what's that all about? Well, we can command angels. Psst. What turnip truck did you fall off of? Yeah, but, you know, we're in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. We are, but that does not mean that you can command angels. Jesus was our example. And he said, I could have asked the Father to send, you know, legions of angels. But notice him as our example. And even though he was the Lord of the hosts, he in his bodily flesh never commanded an angel. Because it's not for man to do. You see, I'm ex-military. And I wish I could say I was special forces, or I was an airborne ranger, or I was combat. I drove a typewriter, I was admin, okay. But I, I was always in command level to where there's a lot of things when you're when you're working for either a, 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 a colonel or a, or, a, or a general, things that you pick up on, Okay. Imagine that we had an elite special forces coming through, and I being a specialist fourth class, which is like a corporal, I start giving orders to special forces. What do they do? They roll their eyeballs at you. I have seen a guy that I knew was enlisted But I believe to this day that he was a Delta and he looked a two-star general in the face and said, Sir, I can't do that. I won't do that. Why? Because Deltas took their orders directly from the President of the United States. 
okay? And so this corporal is going to tell them what to do. There's, there's chains of command. We are, we are made a little lower than Elohim, and that Elohim also refers to divine counsel. I'm ground troops. They're air support. And even back then, they were trying to command angels and all these different things. And he said, the conduct of the angels are better than you. Because they don't appear before the Lord and say, did you, see that? did you hear that stupid thing? Mike Lake thought that he could command me and tell me to go do something. I, boy, you need to do something about that, Father. Are, am, I, am I sinking some of your theological ships this morning? How do we deal with principalities and powers? You ask the Father to send warring angels to fight against them. And the only other way that you can do it is ground warfare. The more hearts and souls that you win of mankind from them, the less power they have. But I'm going up to the higher places. Let me tell you something. A whole bunch of people have done that, that they have shipwrecked their lives. You went and you poked a bear with a stick. Now, if I'm going to go poke a bear, it's going to be with a grenade launcher, a bazooka, 44 Magnum, not a stick. And there have been many a preacher that have woke a bear and wonder why they're now fighting cancer and their families are falling apart. You brought yourself under the target of a principality in which you were given no authority. We wrestle their influence here. You don't go up there and fight them. And then we got, we got Christians teaching on spiritual warfare. They're teaching astral projection. No. <laughs> then what's the difference between you and Blavatsky and all the Kabbalic priests or, or uh, rabbis that are sinning into the second heaven, believing they're being uh, mentored by dead rabbis and they're being mentored by principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. The devil loves playing mind games with you. I tell you what, the devil, if, if, you, if, you, if you submit to this stuff, he can set you in that chair and show you universes that he'll tell you Yahweh has no control of and we're older gods. See, that's what the Masons believe. That Yahweh is only the God of this solar system and there are older gods out there that are older, more powerful than him that they're trying to commune with. I can sell you some lakeshore property in Arizona. And we're having a special on the Brooklyn Bridge this week, this 1995. But see, all this stuff excites the flesh, doesn't it? I can command angels, I can do this, I can do this, I can do that, so that I can get what I want. Mary and I have learned, when you start seeking the face of God for what He wants, you open the door for your needs to be met. And sometimes they'll throw in a couple of ones here and there too, won't he, baby? Every once in a while. Because good daddies do that. Okay. Let's go on. But these, like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, will in destruction of those creatures also be destroyed, suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong. They count it a pleasure to revile in the daytime, or revel in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes, uh, reveling in their deception as they carouse with you having full eyes of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, uh, accursed children forsaking the right way, they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, Beor who loved the wages of unrighteousness. What was the way of Balaam? He couldn't curse the people of God. In fact, one of the most beautiful 
uh, blessings ever spoken over Israel was when Balaam got up and tried to curse them. To this day, it's read in the synagogue every week. How, I'm going to curse you. How beautiful are your tents? <laughs> he couldn't. But he says, here, king, here's what you do. You get some wild women, and you get them in there, and they're wilder than their women, and you get them to sin. You get them to reject your commandments. You get them to reject your feasts. You get them to reject your ways, and God will curse them. Oh, Mark, I'm just so glad we don't have to worry about that today. I thought I heard in Revelation, one of the letters, Jesus said, you follow the ways of Balaam. The doctrine of Balaam. You get Christians off the word. You get them to redefine what sin is so that you can appease the flesh. And as they're going after it like kids after candy their lives begin to fall apart because it creates open doors that allow the enemy access to their lives to devour them. Oh. They're enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, accursed children, forsaking the right way. They have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but he received a rebuke for his own transgression, for a mute donkey speaking with the voice of a man restrained the madness of the prophet. You know, I always look back at the story of that donkey talking and correcting, and I've always looked at that and said, there's hope for me. Because if God can use one donkey... He can use another one that is prone to every once in a while to donkeyisms himself, okay? These are springs without water, mist driven by a storm for whom the black darkness has been reserved. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who bear escape from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what man is overcome, by this man is enslaved. For if after they had escaped the defilement of this world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they enter, they again entangle themselves. Well, I thought there was this once saved, always saved. Okay. Why don't you got your Willy Wonka golden ticket? Grace is irrevocable. God can't kick you out, isn't that? The other side of, no, no, no. Not only saved people, but ministers that were saved go this way. They entangle themselves and have overcome. The last state of them will be worse than the first. For it would be better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than have known, than have known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It is written to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow after washing returns wallowing in the mire. That's the Apostle Peter speaking to the church today. Guys, we've got to wake up. That's why I have preached so hard you can't be called into until you realize what you have been called out of. Now, I know this is deep, but you can't go outside until you leave the building. Now, it, I, I, I'm, I'm waiting for the Nobel Committee to show up just any minute because it's that deep that to walk in the kingdom, you got to leave the world. You got to leave the system. You got to cut it off. I have found out anything the world says is good is bad. Oh, it's the latest and the 
And to show you how screwy the, the world is, anybody remember Cabbage Patch Kids? Everybody had to have one. Those were the most scariest little things. They're creepy. Ugh. But everybody had to have one. Why? Because somebody said everybody ought to have one. And we're just zombies. We've got to have one. We've got to cut off the world. Now, we can love people, but you know the best way to love them is to be an example of Jesus. Now, to be an example of Jesus, you've got to be filled with the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit on the inside of you supernaturally empowers you to walk the commandments of God. If you separate that from being like Jesus, then it's another Jesus. When we do that, we become salt and light in the earth once again. And guys, if we have ever had a time that we need to be salt and light on planet earth, man, it is right now. Because they're, they're reveling in the filth. And where they're trying to take us in the history of humanity, no civilization survived. Ever. You cannot point to one. And so it's time for us to get salty. It's time for us to be filled with the light of God in our lives. Reject unrighteousness. The Apostle Paul in Romans, he said this way, he says, you have two choices. You can either lend your members, your members to unrighteousness or to righteousness. The word salvation wrapped up in it and the authority that we have in, in Jesus. If you ever look up exousia, which behold, I give you authority to go into all the world. That word, the number one meaning in a decent Greek lexicon means the power of choice. Because of Jesus, you can tell the devil no. Because of Jesus, you can tell sin no and crucify that desire. Because of Jesus, you can be in the world, but not of the world, just like he was in the world, but not of the world, because he is now living in us. And we've got to be reminded of that. We have got to, in the body of Christ, we have got to raise the bar because they have lowered it down so low that your big toe will not even fit underneath it anymore. And it's time to raise it up to the standard of Jesus. It's time for us to be demanding. Demanding of ourselves. Demanding of a true theology. Of a true word being preached. I don't care how much it stomps on our toes. I remember when I was, when I was I've been preaching since I was 13. And one of the first things they told me is, if you can't stomp on a few toes, you're not preaching anything worth hearing. But it's now it's supposed to be warm fuzzies, right? Unicorns and glitter. Oh, guys. It's time to return. It's, it's time to shub. That word repent, that also means to return to the ways of God. When we do, we will find his protection, his power, and his provision like we have never dreamed of before. And that's where we're headed. There is a remnant rising that will shake this planet and get that harvest that Jesus is due before he comes back. And I want to be a part of it. Well, Father, today in the name of Jesus, Father, we just ask that you would give us grace to walk in your truth. That you would give us strength to throw off lies and to only embrace your truth. Father, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear your word. And that you would help us walk in spirit and in truth. So that the name of Jesus would be glorified by the lives that we live. And Father, I thank you and I praise you for it in Jesus' name. In the Shinar Directive, we journey down the Luciferian rabbit hole to discover the matrix of darkness that has engulfed our planet. In the Shirith Imperative, we dug deeper to unearth the power source of hell itself and how the body of Christ can labor to impede its functioning in the earth and lay the groundwork for revival.
Now it is time to unveil the mysteries of both the priesthood of the kingdom of God and the priesthood of darkness. Until these mysteries are understood, God's remnant cannot realize their purpose or be released with heaven's power to overcome the agenda of the denizens of the second heaven. The kingdom priesthood is a training manual for the remnant to discover their priesthood, their purpose, and their service to Almighty God. In the pages of this remnant manual you will discover what Adam experienced in the first few moments of life and how those desires were written into the DNA of humanity. Revelations of what the Almighty meant when he told Adam and Eve to replenish the earth. Who were the first priests of the kingdom of God in the Bible? And who was the first priest of darkness? What was the knowledge of the tree of good and evil offering the first family of humanity? How we all share the same calling as Abel. The reality of the principalities' wars and how it is influencing the world today. As believers, how we are to function as both a priest and a tabernacle. The real purpose of the fire of God. How to carry the name of God in the earth with dignity and power. How the priesthood is essential for the releasing of end time warriors in the last days. How to flow in the sevenfold anointing of the Holy Spirit to represent Messiah. The kingdom priesthood is a call for the remnant to receive the fire of God and become the assembly that the gates of hell cannot overcome. Get your copy today at Amazon.com or KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. That's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.